Hey there, Tommy from The Run Testers. In this video, we are going to be talking about running watches. So everything you need to know about buying a running watch, the sort of features you can expect, the battery life, all those sorts of things to make sure that you're not spending too much money on a watch that you might not necessarily need. This video is also part of the podcast. So if you're planning on listening to the podcast, maybe skip this video because it's all on there as well. Right, let's dip in and see what we all thought. All right, guys, so we get a lot of questions on the channel about running watches and how to buy running watches, and it can be quite confusing for people, especially if they're new to buying watches. And when you're looking at you know, upwards of £500 for some of the more premium ones, it's, it's a decision that probably needs quite a bit of thought. So uh, what we're going to do here is go through some of the main questions that we get around um, running watches and help people understand a little bit better about how to, they can start choosing which one they actually want to, to, to be looking at. Um, so let's jump. Let's jump into a uh, nice, simple one. Uh, Nick, you can tackle this one to start with. Um, how expensive do you think a running watch needs to be? Well, needs to be. Needs to be. It's a tough question. <laughs> um, I think they are a lot cheaper. They're still, you know, as gear goes, the minimum price is still reasonably high of a running watch. I think to get GPS and heart rate tracking, you know, and, and a reasonable battery life, you're still looking at. 100 quid kind of thing for the older models from uh, brands like Garmin and Coros if you're going on, on the cheap. I mean, Decathlon has a very good watch for £130, the Kipron 500, but mm -hmm. that's still quite a lot of money, you know, compared to lots of other things. There are some cheaper ones, just, you know, Mike's a big, uh, well, expert on like the Amazfit range, which does have some cheaper ones under £100, but it gets a little bit sketchy there. You might not get a screen you can really read that easily on the run. I still think you're probably looking at close to 100 pounds for an older model of a really good watch that's going to work very well as a running watch and then from there you know the sky's the limit isn't it uh, i think probably there's really good watches between if under 200 pounds these days there are multi-sport watches as well that offer everything you really need and then you start looking at frills beyond that price that are great frills frills i love like amoled screens and multi-band gps and maps and music and all that but um, they're probably less essential than i think the core features it's very easy to find now and really good watches for under 200 but it's still Still not really getting like amazing watches for 50 quid. So out of those different price range, Kieran is one for you. Um, how do you choose a running watch for your price range? Yeah, I mean, this is this is an interesting question because there's, there's obviously so many different kind of features that you'll get across the kind of price ranges. And for me, my starting point has always been to do something simple. Like I'll make a list of the things that are kind of um, essentials. You know, they're the things... Non-negotiables, Sean Dyche would call them in the football world if he was training Everton. These are the things that you you, you really desperately you know want to have in your watch, and that will give you a starting point to go and kind of cross cross reference a bunch of um, different devices. And you know you're thinking about things, some of the things that Nick mentioned that differentiate these watches. Do you do you really want to have that kind of uber accuracy kind of multi band GPS? Do you care about having offline music? Does the AMOLED screen make a difference? Is your main thing having a really long battery life? Do you want a battery life that extends with kind of low power mode that goes further? Those kind of things. If you can start to kind of put together that short list, it gives you something to go and essentially start your research with. Um, the only thing about that is I think it's really important to be really honest with yourself about which of those things are really important. And there are some things that I think inevitably you might have to make a sacrifice if your budget doesn't sort of stretch up to those kind of 500 and beyond. And you can ask yourself a question, do I really need it to play music or will I always have my phone with me so that I can listen to music through my phone? Are there other cheaper ways of getting some of the things? I think a big thing for me, which makes it interesting, we're always sort of testing the heart rate accuracy. A lot of the cheaper watches maybe have heart rate, optical heart rate monitors that aren't necessarily bang on. You can kind of supplement that maybe with a cheap chest strap. Uh, and add kind of heart rate accuracy without going kind of too far up the scale. So you can start to kind of pick out those key points. But yeah, definitely having a little bit of thought before you go into it about what your your key kind of must haves are is, is really useful. Yeah, I agree. Um, I always I always think with watches, it's 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 very easy to look through the the features and everything and think, oh, I want all of those things, and I'm going to pay two hundred pounds more than I originally intended to. But as we test watches, sometimes we'll test the more entry-level watches, then and sometimes we'll test the more premium watches. What I often find is that when I'm going for an entry-level watch or something that's probably lower down the list, I, I I don't know, after testing it for a couple of weeks, I don't think oh, I want that watch on because it's got all the features that I'm using anyway. So it, 
it may be nice to have some of these features, but you might you probably don't need them. Um, and then there's a, there's another thing which I think you can. One thing is sort of if you're coming in at the kind of entry level and you're thinking about where your running might go and you're a beginner, you might want to give yourself some headroom. So you mm. might find there are features later on that you need, and you don't want to sort of have to invest in two watches. There's another really good trick that you could do right now, which is you could use um, Chat GPT essentially to say these are the four watches that I'm thinking about. Pull me together a table of all the specs in comparison, and it will do it for you. So you can you can use it to get really easy comparative stats out of this. There are lots of the AI tools that make it simple to do all of that trawling. Because I mean, and some some brands are really good at putting their specs side by side for their watches. Coros are pretty good at giving you comparatives. Um, some of the others, it's quite difficult. You have to kind of get a spreadsheet open, but some of those AI tools will do that for you now. How very modern of you. Mm. I, well, <laughs> oh, I think one other thing to talk about on price range that we don't cover actually that much on the channel ourselves because I don't think it's a huge deal for any of us is materials used. But some people will, if you start thinking that you need the most rugged watch out there, that massively increases the price if you're starting to think about mm. things like titanium mm. and temperatures it can go to. So uh, that can really put a bracket on your price range if you do need something that's incredibly resilient on that front. And if you live in the UK, don't worry too much about solar-powered watches. <laughs> no, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so so let's jump into a bit more about specifics around features. Um, Mike, this is a good one for you since you're the, the man who knows everything about watch features, like a glossary of uh, watch features at the moment. What different features should people look for in a running watch? Say you're new to to. to to really watch is what, what what are the main things you should be looking out for i think there's some pretty consistent things across all watches and i think most runners will generally want now obviously you do want built in gps and that every watch has built in gps but i think what on top of that potentially you might want is you might want to have the ability to kind of play around with that level of gps accuracy because you might not need you know particularly where you run or the environments you run in you might be able to preserve your battery life and still get that real kind of optimum accuracy. So I think, you know, having that kind of room to kind of um, kind of alter that kind of GPS accuracy, depending on the environment, is a really nice feature to have. But I don't mean, you know, you want built-in GPS and pretty much every watch has that. I think also a key thing, I think, for me, I think most people look for, is, you know, that ability to kind of play around the data fields and how your screens look. And whether that's your someone who wants very simple looking bits of data on your screen when you're looking down at your wrist or you want something a bit more complex, you know, looking for the, you know, the watches that kind of support that, it might mean that you have to go for a bigger watch over a smaller watch um, and having the freedom to kind of customize, I think is a really strong thing. And ultimately putting the data in front of you that you really want to see, I think, you know, during that run, you know, before the run, things that can help you govern your kind of training. I think those are kind of key things. We talk about heart rate monitoring a lot. Now, not everyone trains by heart rate and everyone needs to see that heart rate information but if you want that heart rate data and you rely on it i think having a watch that has a the ability to pair external heart rate monitor straps you'll hear us say in pretty much all of our videos i think you know wrist-based heart rate monitoring is very, very good and it's good for most runs but if you really rely on that accuracy then you want a watch that can pair to a external heart rate monitor so you know De definitely look at you know what, what types of connectivity support those watches have and what kind of heart monitors that opens it up in terms of that kind of pairing i think the other thing i think you know there's other things i think are desirable features but not necessarily necessary features when you're starting to look a bit more in terms of your training a little bit more in terms of your analysis so whether it's the ability to create workouts you know bring the workouts onto your watch so it's easy to kind of follow them you're not kind of you know hamstrung to your you know your phone and, and keeping an eye on what you're, you want to do for that session i think those are really nice things to have and kind of we're start, starting to see watches delve a little bit more into kind of training analysis whether that's helping you kind of look in terms of you know how to recover when you should recover when you should you know run or, or kind of rest you know looking at seeing you're making very clear improvements whether you need to kind of ease off or whether there's certain kind of types of sessions you should be doing those aren't in essential features but i think those are nice features to have and it's very reliant on those other sensors making sure they're delivering that accuracy and that kind of accurate level of data so that's something to kind of keep in mind but i think those are the kind of key things i would be looking for i would be saying to people to look for when they're kind of you know looking for those key features already this is an interesting one I came up with this question myself oh. um, because it's something that has cropped up quite a bit in testing. Um, and that is what what technical limitations do people need to be aware of when they're picking up a running watch? And why that, I mean, it can be anything like the features or, you know, the software or anything like that. 
Oh, limitations mostly concern accuracy, probably for the most part. Like these are, they're pretty marvelous these days, uh, modern running watches, but they are still not going to be perfect all the time on accuracy. Heart rate in particular, optical heart rate is a very hard thing to do. I had a long chat with some of the teams at big running watch brand who are very good at this stuff, but if you want to design the worst place you could possibly put a heart rate monitor, it would basically be the wrist while running because your arms are all over the place and it's a thin part of the body. So even the best watches are going to struggle sometimes on that front, like Mike mentioned. Um, and Accuracy of GPS, like I'm obsessed about GPS, love multiband GPS, but even with the best multiband GPS uh, available, I use two watches with those, uh, with that at the London Marathon at the weekend and in Canary Wharf, they still struggle to get accurate pacing and distance because it's just very hard to get good GPS there. So you, you could expect very good performance on both those fronts, but you can't expect perfection. And obviously that fees, there's a lot to do with the training analysis and sleep analysis, in particular on the watches that, I mean, these are, useful tools that can certainly help guide what you're doing but they aren't perfect and uh, they wouldn't i wouldn't you know stake my life on the uh, training readiness feature of a watch or the recovery advisor on it but it's all those things you got to take with a bit of pinch of salt they're all very clever they do work most of the time they do work up to a point and then there's a little bit of the potential for inaccuracy because it's a very hard thing to do and the other limitation i suppose comes to mind to me with watches is, is how much battery they can pack in uh, and as a trade-off versus things like size and screen brightness and still yet to get the watch that can offer the battery life of something like the Garmin Enduro or the Chorus Vertex 2 that's quite a small delicate watch with a bright screen it's all those kind of things you're it's constantly a trade-off buying a running watch and technical limitations plays into that as well cool and then fine I'll just add to that uh, uh, the one of the limitations I always find is when you look at the spec sheets or the marketing material around watches, that w- when there's a feature like maps or turn-by-turn turn navigation and things like that, it's very different on different watches. Mm. So just having that feature on a watch does not necessarily mean it's as good as the feature that's on another another watch. Um, so sometimes the actual features themselves are limitations because they're not as good as they sh- you, you expect them to be when you get it. Um, and I think that's the same for a lot of the features on those watches. So things like music on watches, I never fa- find to be that good and ne- ne- never that usable. Um, but also it can have an imp- Im- impact on battery life and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, some of the features, um, just be aware of the features on watches because sometimes they're they're not as good as they sound. Um, I just, I just, I, I, sorry, uh, Mike, go on, you go. Oh, sorry. You're- no, no, just to kind of add, uh, Nick, in terms of those kind of adding those kind of additional metrics, I think what we're seeing and I think will evolve over time is having these lots of metrics, lots of, lots of information, but actually having the actionable data, the actionable kind of insights with that data. I think that is de- very much a limitation of a lot of these things where you know, you're having a lot of information thrown at you, which potentially could be useful, but mm. a lot of these brands are still up in terms of delivering that information in a way that you can understand and put it to good use and while you can get that with some of the features on these running watches a lot of the features are still delivering a lot of data but not really putting it in a really kind of nice you know presenting it in a really nice intuitive way nice. And I'd, I'd follow on from that Mike, which is that there's a few things when you look at like, readiness is a really big one where a lot of the watches calculate readiness by they mash together a load of metrics different metrics whether it's your sleep your kind of resting heart rate other bits and pieces that Essentially, if they're not 100% accurate at that, and we know that there's big limitations on the accuracy of sleep, and they try to combine this into the readiness score, when you wake up in the morning, that readiness score is going to be off. So you have to be aware that it's when, when, you're, when you're amalgamating a lot of data to try and get you this one really nice and tidy and easy to understand score that says, yeah, go and, or no, don't go. If the data that it's feeding from in six different pools isn't right, that's not bang on. And I would absolutely recommend watches that go with sort of a straight HRV reading if you can, because your heart rate variability is actually a response to all of those other bits of physiology that affect your readiness. So that's a, that's a good kind of score. And I think that's a, that's a big thing. I, the other one that I think is sort of people get baffled by is the, the idea of productivity and what's not, you know, when your training is productive and not. And I think understanding how and why and where your watch is calculating those kind of training insights and metrics is really un- important if you can. And not all brands are brilliant at explaining how they're getting to those numbers. And if you don't understand how they get there, for me, it, it kind of, yeah, it makes it a bit difficult to really kind of ensure that they're, they're accurate or understand how to use them properly. Yeah, and I don't quickly forward for that is you can see that really clearly with things like race time predictions and stuff like that. So use yeah. that as your barometer to know roughly where your watch is gauged by because it's like I said, it's based on these algorithms that might not apply to you perfectly. Yeah. I think, well, actually, one we, I should have mentioned earlier that I think it was quite interesting that people mentioned is I wore two watches and got different GPS readings on both. <laughs> That's just going to happen. That's because GPS is not that accurate. The same way when you go and run a marathon or a race, your watch will not give you the, the exact race distance because 
GPS is not that accurate. It's, it's never. It's always the watch's fault. Put it that way. It's never that the race course. It's yeah. well. Sometimes the race course is wrong. Brighton Marathon, but mostly it's uh, <laughs> it's the fault of the. Not this year. <laughs> not this year. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> Let's jump into a really quick one. Mike, you can tackle this one um, because Karen's got a big question coming up. So just (laughs) simply pop, Mike, what's the difference between a smartwatch and a running watch? Okay, so I would say say the two things are definitely blurring a little bit more, but ultimately what I would say is a smartwatch can track runs but will offer more uses outside of that tracking time. So ultimately, you're getting something more sophisticated in terms of dealing with things like notifications. If you like using kind of music or listening to music on your smartwatch or kind of syncing it over, you know, the app support as well outside of, you know, kind of run focused things, you're going to get a bit more on that front as well. But I think on the kind of flip side is that you're probably getting a little bit less battery life, whether that's kind of day-to-day battery life, but also in terms of that GPS battery life as well. So that's really what separates... I would say a smartwatch from a running watch where you're getting something very more focused, something with the running watch will give you more battery life, more in terms of that kind of level metrics out, you know, out of the box ultimately, whereas you might have to work a little bit harder to find those features or get those features on a smartwatch. A beautifully succinct answer. <laughs> very nice. Did you get that off chat GPT? <laughs> no, that's all my knowledge, all my knowledge. <laughs> All right, and talking about battery life, it's cropped up a, a few times. Uh, Kieran, you're a man who is you're keen on long battery life. Uh, how much battery life can people expect from different running watches? Yeah, I, I mean, battery life is really important for me. I hate charging my watch for a start, but also I like if I'm if you know if you're going to do an ultra, you're going to go long. You need something that's going to go you know over twelve hours to do a hundred k, even if you're pretty quick. And you need if you're going to do multi day, you need something that's going to stretch further than that. So. I mean, the, the thing is that actually with this, it's jumped on quite a lot, even in the last kind of couple of generations. So I think most watches at most levels now are starting to offer somewhere around kind of 30 hours in kind of full GPS mode, which is really strong. And I think now you should really be kind of looking for that, I think, as the kind of lower benchmark for a lot of it, unless you're going to do what Nick was talking about earlier, and you're going to go for you know a really sort of cheap sort of 100 pound watch that's a, an older generation and then you're starting to get some crazy numbers higher up the scale. You know, the Coros Vertex 2 will claim 140 hours kind of full GPS. The other thing I think, you know, which I is a really good thing, you know, Mike talked about kind of being able to sort of change up your settings so that you can extend that battery life. But max power modes are great. If you're going to go and do a 100 miler, it doesn't really matter how, you know, the accuracy of the of the GPS tracks are not as important as actually that watch kind of lasting the distance. So you want something that you're going to be able to extend and still have your watch working there's nothing worse than having that drop out halfway through a big long run like that. It's definitely happened to me. I mean, I, I go back, you know, three, eight, four or five years and I'd be having to take two watches to do something like a hundred mile ultra and switch them out halfway through or charge them up. And we're no longer in that world. So yeah, anywhere between 30 hours and probably like 140, you can expect now. And there's kind of gradations up through that. And for your, you know, your park runner uh, goes out and does park run, does a couple of other runs, Maybe got themselves a you know four on a fifty five something like that. What sort yeah. of battery life GPS are you going to get on those? Uh, anyone? I mean, still looking at yeah. Well, that's like I mean I mean like the four the four oh you know having a look at the kind of bottom actually the forty five you're getting kind of a week of kind of day to day battery life and then probably thirteen to kind of fifteen hours in GPS battery life. So mm-hmm. you're getting you know something that's probably going to last for people doing a couple of sessions maybe a longer run you know someone who's probably not running as frequently as someone who's maybe running four or five times a week but it's probably going to be enough in terms of using those other things just to kind of i thought it was worth adding is if you are looking at running watches i think some you know these watches are evolving and there's some things that are going to have a bit more of a battery drain on those watches so things like um having if you're an amoled display having that screen on always on things like pulse ox sensors drain the battery life more music streaming does the new dual dual, uh, band gps mode that we're seeing on new watches those will hit the battery life harder so looking at those features and really digging into how the companies or the brands reflect those battery numbers based on those features is really important i think as well i'd also say that um looking beyond the gps figures to real world uses the brands have very different approaches to how your watch performs in between runs so and that massively changes how long they'll last so watch for example, a Coros and a Polo watch that will both have 40 hours of GPS, 
the Polar Watch will last maximum seven days because it will be using doing quite a lot at night, lots of heart rate variability tracking. They just say seven days roughly is what you're going to get from it. Chorus Watch is going to last two or three weeks because it doesn't take it doesn't automatically even take your heart rate 24 seven unless you turn that on and the screen's a bit duller. So a Garmin almost splits the difference. But I do, yeah, so it is uh, in terms of real world usage when you're just kind of training each week. So for example, the Chorus Watch I used recently, I did 15 hours of GPS training across two weeks um, and. So individual single activity, it will last exactly as long as a Polar Watch, but in real world use, it might last twice as long because it's not doing anything in between runs, really. So if you get a more basic watch on that front, it can actually extend the battery life uh, quite a lot. And, and I think some good ones actually now, they're starting to give you that kind of customization. You can go to a sort of particular area in the watch and start to fiddle with those things. And it makes it really easy to sort of see where the usage is, is going. And so you can kind of customize that. So I think that's another thing if... No, it's great having all those features, but the ability to be able to switch them all on and off as and when you need them is also, I think, starting to be a really, a really handy thing on, on the best watches. I think there's still also a massive differentiation between this and smartwatches where I think there are a bit of merging going on now where the Apple Watch Ultra has a, obviously a two-day battery life, still nothing really compared to a sports watch, but certainly some Garmin watches. I feel like Garmin have, are saying now that our battery life is actually, we're happy with it. If we can get to four to seven days, we're now just going to start adding more features instead of adding more battery life uh, in the future. Yeah. So there is maybe the emerging around there for those kind of bright screens and good sports track. Cool. Okay, let's talk durability. Probably not too much to discuss on this one, but um, uh, who's isn't it? Nick, how important is durability? Durability is very important. You want your watch running watch is going to take some knocks. Like um, even if you are purely a road runner, you're going to hit it on something or something like that. And it's you know you don't want it to chip or fray. You don't want the screen to crack, and you want the screen to work for many years to come. I think that was a big fear with AMOLED screens on watches. And still, obviously, we've only had things like the Epics and that for a couple of years in the venue. But it doesn't seem like you know people worry about burning on AMOLED displays that you know it starts to get shadows of things that have been on the on the display in the past. It doesn't seem to have been a real problem, but. Yeah, some watches are really built for everything. You know, Garmin, the Garmin Instant Rage, and then then you look at the more expensive metal watches like the Chorus Vertex Two and the Garmin Phoenix Enduro watches that are built to withstand everything. Whereas all plastic watches are probably going to be a bit less durable. But I think it's it's still for me for my life as a road runner, it's still quite hard to smash up a watch. They all are all pretty durable these days, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I've cracked one. I think I've scratched one screen. I think over my years of testing, and that was this year. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah a smart watches might be a little bit less that because they like to have things like edge to edge displays yeah. which are a bit more prone yeah. to taking a knock but even then i've never broken uh an, like an apple watch and i have I've broken several apple phones so <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, i once drove over my apple watch in my driveway by accident um <laughs> Yeah. Did it survive? It wasn't very, it didn't, no. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the yeah. level, yeah. If you're one of those runners who's constantly <laughs> under cars, you are going to break your watch yeah. a bit more. But <laughs> So, um, actually, you can take it in turns to go through this if you want. But basically, what, what are the top running brands, running watch brands, that people should be aware of? And <clears throat> what are the sort of top-line benefits of each of them um, and, and, and what, what people could expect from those from those ones. Let's start with Garmin. Who wants to go first? Should I go? <laughs> I mean, massive, massive, massive collection. Massive collection, a watch for all ranges or abilities. I think good core running features across the board, good battery life overall. I think there's kind of something for everyone. If you want something really basic, you have that in the Garmin range. If you want something a bit more advanced, you've got the kind of forerunner, the kind of top end forerunners, the Epics and the Phoenix watches. I think that's the best way to kind of look at the Garmin. Um, range of one watches i think probably the area where garmin is very much clear of its competitors and sports watches is on the top end watches that have the best yeah. by far the best mapping experience the most easy to use yeah. music experience the you know the best well maybe not the best but a training analysis is as good as anything and sports track and the best multi-band gps so that's i think where they're quite clear in, the, in that real top bracket of watches but at the lower ranges i think it's their essentials are quite similar to the other brands well then coros i mean Coros for me, standout for Coros is is basically the battery life, really. Although you know, and Nick will talk about this, I'm sure, but you that you make sacrifices for the, that battery life. It kind of ekes out the battery life by not having quite a bright screen, or maybe you you pay a little bit in GPS accuracy and some of the other things. But for me, that's still the thing that really stands out for them. And they offer, I guess, kind of a wide range of um, training insights, performance insights, and what what used to be a really really competitive price. I think that's being squeezed a little bit now. We've seen the prices come up, so it's not 
there's not so much distance between them and some of the, the competitors. But for me, it's about that kind of whopping great 140 hour battery life that I was talking about. That's the one thing that still jumps out for me in a Coros. Mm. I would I would probably just add that I think of all the ranges and I think which is I think is really I think also stands out to Coros is the fact they've been very consistent with their updates across their watches. Mm. And I think that's a really important thing. I think you know they've tried to give the same features on their cheapest pace watch across to its kind of. Uh, apex and vertex watches and you know you don't you rarely get that kind of level of support i think from the other brands you know, you, you know we see people talk about garments and not rolling features back to older watches but chorus has almost created an ecosystem where they want to try and do that as best as they can for as long as possible and i think that's a really strong kind of aspect of their range yeah i think chorus really stands out at the almost the entry level well the best value watches things like the chorus pace 2 and the decathlon watches that use chorus technology that's where they're really strong because they offer so much battery life and great features for a good price i think at their more expensive watches where they're trying to offer values by using incredibly nice materials for less than you find from other brands but we're not big materials guys i think we've made that quite clear but um <laughs> and, uh, but they but then they do fall behind on things like gps accuracy their music is really like it's all drag and drop there's no streaming support the maps don't have turn by turn so they have a lot of features but don't really match up the features that well to what you get from Garmin at the high end. But they are incredible. I think the best thing about them is the way they roll out features across the range. I think it's a very democratic approach. And it means that a watch like the Pace 2 offers incredible value. Cool. Okay, well, we'll we'll delve more into the different watch brands in when Mike gets around to doing the best watches video. Um, <laughs> but you've got one more pick. What are you going to let people know about uh, in terms of the watch brands that they should be looking out for? I mean, I think I think we have to give a shout out to Apple as much as people will probably hate us to say the Apple Watch. <laughs> but I mean, the Apple Watch has is, is, is evolved into, I for me, not only the you know the best smartwatch for runners, but I think one of the best running watches. And I didn't think I would I would be someone saying that, but I think you know you might have to work a little bit harder to get the best out of the, some of the other kind of additional and analytics. But the core run tracking experience, I think, is very very strong on the Apple Watch Ultra, and I think on the on the Series A as well, and the battery life hopefully will get better um but i do think you know the improvements are there are there to be seen i think apple have made a really good um you know off offering in terms of what they've done with the apple watch in terms of a run tracking experience overall polar i think you know polar makes some great watches as well and i think they make some really good value watches i think they're particularly strong at the kind of the the training load recovery that kind of that kind of thing i think actually they've got some good kind of crossover fitness and and running watches at a very sort of cheap end as well um I feel like they had a moment where they were they were really trying to kick on. They were being quite innovative with some of the new features that we were seeing, like fuel wise and those things. And it just feels like it's dropped off a little bit, and they've they've lost a little bit of that ground to the other brands. But they still do have great watches in their lineup. Hmm. Yeah, I I just I really like Polar as a company. I think they really approach things in a good way, but I think their designs have fallen behind some of the other brands and. When they have started to introduce features like that, was very some really confusing things like the, the way the multi band GPS was brought to the Ignite 3, quite a random AMOLED watch that had very bad GPS, it turns out. And yeah, yeah so yeah, there's been a few missteps, but it's interesting. They've obviously they're, they uh, sold, they're selling their tech for other companies to use. And the Casio yeah. watch I tested recently has some polar features on it, had a lot of other problems, but the polar features are good on it. <laughs> cool. Um, All right, then. Yeah. Well, um, as I say, there will be a Best Watches video that may be up when you're listening to or watching this um, video. So uh, te- check that out for more of the watches that are available at the moment. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll Thanks, catch, catch yeah. you next time. So that's it from us on this video about how to buy running watches. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, all those sorts of things. And check the channel out for all the videos we've got coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, and if you want to listen to the podcast, although you've already heard some of the and if you and if you go into the caption below, you can find a link to the podcast, which this video is part of. But there's also loads of other stuff on there as well, like um, updates on the latest gear that's coming out. And we answer your questions. And there's an interview with uh, Edna Kiplaga about her marathon running and training as well. So plenty more on there if you want a bit more than what's on this video. Right. Catch you next time. <laughs>